and uh, I'll share the screen. And this is chapter four. Okay, so I said today's, again, those who joined later, so today's gonna be like more like a lecture rather than a lab. And uh, that's about what's called molecules of life. Okay, so molecules of life, they are organic molecules. And actually, you know what? I'm gonna use the whiteboard. So these are organic molecules. What is organic molecule? Any molecules, so first of all, nothing to do with uh, whatever you hear, organic, which means like natural, uh, not really. Organic molecules, they have carbon, right? So carbon, bless you. And at least, at least, one, one atom of hydrogen. So, should be C, should be H. So tell me, is water organic molecule? Is it an organic molecule? No. No, right? It doesn't have carbon. Mm -hmm. Is this one organic molecule? Yes. No. Oh. No, what do you see hydrogen? Right? Oh, CO2, the one that we exhale, <laughs> is also inorganic. This is methane. Is this organic? Yes. Yes. So it should be carbon and again, at least one hydrogen. Um, so basically organic molecules, they made from the core of carbon, right? It could be one carbon, it could be two carbons, it could be many carbons. So carbon, remember, can make four bonds, right? So these four bonds will allow it to actually bond itself right? Uh, it will allow to bond like other groups, other atoms, right? Um, like hydrogen, again, uh, it could be chain, it could be straight chain, it might be pentagon, it might be hexagon, it might be octagon, right? But again, what will be really special about all these molecules is the carbon bees. Again, carbon can uh, form double bonds with itself, for example, like this. Um, carbon can form double bond with oxygen, right? Like with CO2, this is inorganic, of course. So again, the bulk of organic molecules is the same, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, but again, the core of all organic molecules is made of carbon. And uh, what's also special about organic molecules is that they all burn. Like you can pretty much like burn any organic substance. Can you burn uh, alcohol, which is organic? Yes. Yes. Can you burn oils, which are organic? Yeah. Yes. You can burn cellulose paper, which is also organic. Okay. Um, can we burn carbon dioxide, which is inorganic? Not really. You can burn carbon dioxide. It's a gas. Again, a bunch of gases. You can burn them, right? Uh, but carbon dioxide, you can really burn. So this is another important feature of organic molecules. Now, another thing is that uh, molecules could be simple. What is a simple molecule? If you take molecule of glucose, and glucose is pure organic molecule, it's C6H12O6, this is glucose, and it's a simple molecule. What is more simple? It's just one unit. And it's also called monomer. Mono means single. Okay. But in nature, you occasionally, naturally, naturally, you occasionally can find glucose molecule just the way it is on its own as a monomer. 
In nature, you normally see something called macromolecules. Macromolecules are complex molecules. Complex molecules are usually made of units of simple molecules. So monomers form long chains called polymers. It's like you take, for example, like links of the chain, right? Or you take the cars of the train, something like that, okay? So simple molecules build complex molecules. Polymers, again, sometimes called macro molecules. So um, the thing is that uh, we deal with macromolecules normally when we eat, when we get our food, right? Did you eat breakfast, guys, already? Did you have a chance to eat breakfast? Mm. Yes. Or, yes. What did you have for breakfast? I just had a banana before going to the gym. Okay, you had a banana. Okay, so last thing, what do you have in banana? In banana, we have uh, many good things, actually. Uh, on top of the banana is a good source of calcium and potassium, but you have complex molecules called carbohydrates, right? You have complex molecules called proteins. You have complex molecules called fats. Not that many, but they can squeeze some fat out of banana, actually. Not much. And it's a good fat. And you also have complex molecules called nucleic acids, right? So when you eat, you take in polymers, you take macromolecules. And the job of your digestive system, right, is to do what? What your digestive system gonna do? Break them down? Exactly. Digestive system will break it down back to monomers. Why? Your cells can't take in big large molecules just impossible right so for your cells to take them for different reasons as a source of energy or as a building blocks right first they have to be broken down so this is actually kind of like a cir circulation i don't know how you can call it but it's a circuit taking complex breaking them down and building complex again so um we're going to talk about four major groups of um, organic molecules. They also called molecules of life. So four groups, and I'm going to write here monomers. Yeah, I'm going to write polymers. In the first group, monomers, we call them simple sugars. sugars form polymers we call carbohydrates. Okay. The second group we call fatty acids. Fatty acids form molecules, they're not exactly polymers, they don't really form like a long chains, but these large molecules, as super important molecules, we call them lipids. Or fats, right? Simple molecules called amino acids. On complex molecules, we call proteins. And there are simple molecules called nucleotides. Nucleotides form polymers called nucleic acids. And nucleic acids, I'm pretty sure you heard DNA, right? DNA, RNA, so these are nucleic acids, okay? So these are four important groups for us, okay? And as I said, this is what we get with the food, right? Your digestive system will break them down to monomers, right? And then your cells will utilize them like they will rebuild something out of them or gonna use them as a fuel. Can I switch to PowerPoint, guys? May I? Yeah. Yes. Yes. 
So uh, we're gonna start with the carbs, right? Um, okay, so carbs. Um, and you can see this picture, like what are the sources of carbs in our food, right? So we um, take carbs in with bread, with bananas, Victoria, right? With pasta, with greens, with potatoes, with rice, right? Um, this is one of the like basically one of the most important groups of uh, you know groups in our diet, the carbohydrates, right? So we like carbs, right? You agree with me that we like carbs? Yeah. Yeah. Why do we like carbs? When you look at carbs, your brain understands one simple thing. And the simple thing that your brain sees is energy, right? So we use these molecules primarily as a fuel. Why so? Because all complex carbs that we take, eventually, eventually, your digestive system, and the digestive system does it fairly fast, will break it down to glucose, right? So all these carbs are basically polymers of glucose molecule or molecules that are closely related to that. So simple sugars are also called monosaccharides. Mono, again, single. Monosaccharides. And again, these are energy molecules. So number one is glucose, right? Almost, almost a twin, right? Almost a twin is fructose, right? Glucose is found in common carbs like starch. It makes up starch, right? Fructose is what's called like again, fruct sugar is usually found in fruits. Uh, galactose is a simple sugar that is found in milk, right? It's the one that you take with the milk. Do you know that milk is actually is primarily source of carbs rather than proteins, okay? So these are monosaccharides. And basically, basically, your digestive system, your cells will target foremost glucose. Why glucose? Because of this. Okay, this is glucose one more time, C6H12O6 plus oxygen, right? Will give you carbon dioxide and water. And all the reaction of respiration. Okay. And this is the most important reaction in your cells because this is the reaction that gives energy yourself to function okay so super important molecule and this molecule is tightly controlled the levels of this molecule are tightly controlling your blood right how much glucose is available for your cells for energy so it's regulated and um if i go back to powerpoint what you can see Glucose, the blood sugar, right, is needed as a fuel for cellular activity, right? And uh, if you have surplus of glucose, your body can store it as a glycogen. Glycogen is a polymer of glucose that usually is usually built in your liver and in your muscles, okay? And when you need energy, when you need flu fuel, <coughs> glycogen, could be broken down to glucose to provide you with this, okay? And uh, what I want to show you is that um, cells, sorry, plants. Plants produce glucose for us, right? How plants produce glucose? Exactly opposite of what we do, right? So we do respiration. What plants do, plants take carbon dioxide in the water and sunlight energy. And what they do, they do glucose, right? 
plus oxygen. So what's the name of this reaction? How is this reaction called? Um, I think it's called photosynthesis. Exactly, photosynthesis. So what you can see from this reaction, right, is that plants, plants provide us with the fuel, right? With the most important components of fuel, glucose and oxygen, right? Or you can say that your energy indirectly comes from sunlight energy, right? So plants lock, the plants lock this energy in the molecules of glucose. So as I said, you can't really find glucose the way it is. So what plants do, plants take glucose and plants can store it. How they can store it? As I said, the most common way of storage is starch. Starch is literally polymer of glucose. Glucose can also be used by plants as a building molecule for structural support, and it's called cellulose. Can you tell me what is cellulose? What is an example of cellulose? I think it's the, um, I think cellulose is the uh, types of cells that help, that help, that's in the plants that helps them eat the sugar. Cellulose is actually wood. That's cellulose. Uh, uh, paper is cellulose. And uh, cellulose is found in stems and leaves of plants. And the cellulose also makes like a cell wall of the plant cell. As I said, it provides structural support. But you know what's really interesting? If we take glucose, sorry, if we take... Um, uh, look, what I just want to show you. This is uh, starch, right? I think it's a starch molecule. Yes, this is the starch molecule. So starch molecule, as I said, it's a polymer of glucose. The bonds between glucose could be broken easily by our digestive system. Basically, you start digesting starch uh, already in your mouth just chewing, mixing with saliva, saliva already has enzymes to break down starch, right? So we greatly benefit from eating starch because again, almost in no time, it will be broken down to glucose. Uh, regarding cellulose, right? We don't really, we're not really able to break down the bonds, right? Can you eat paper, may I ask you? Uh, no. Yes. And, yes, and technically you can eat paper. Like, I mean, you can chew paper. You're going to benefit from chewing it? No. no. No, because you won't be able to digest it. Okay, that's the whole thing. Um, sorry. So, guys, let me just rearrange you. <laughs> rearrange this window. Okay, and again, the reason why we can't eat, I mean, why we can't digest cellulose is that we don't have the right enzymes to do so, right? Um, but we constantly take cellulose in, right? When we eat fruits and veggies, in fruits and veggies, cellulose is present and it's known as digestive fibers, right? Can you give an example of fruit or veggie that is high in fibers? You can literally see these fibers. You can like take them apart. Uh, mangoes. Um, mangoes, absolutely. What else? Strawberries. Strawberries, yeah. Uh, apples. Apples also have fibers. Kiwi. Kiwi, but I should say like something that is really, really like apparent. You can see this fibers. I should say celery. Celery is a very good example of fibers. Well, pineapples. Pineapples. Yes, true. Pineapples. Avocados. So avocados. 
it's uh, I mean it did not that fresh right <laughs> when they start actually wow. yeah. Yeah. Nice. you can see this fibers and avocados as well broccoli uh, yes broccoli it's cabbage yes it's also rich in fibers so uh, that's why I don't know if you heard that it's actually good to eat food that is rich in fibers uh, first of all they help they help with digestion, basically. Uh, all these dietary fibers, they stimulate uh, digestive tract, right? So keeping it healthy. And second, since you can digest them, you can consume them, uh, means you get less calories, right? So for example, eating celery, yes, you're going to get calories from eating celery, but you're going to get less than, for example, eating a cookie, because cookie is a starch, it will be fully digested. Celery, there are fibers that won't be digested. Make sense? So let me explain you something. Um, regarding, um, regarding cellulose and regarding uh, starch. So for example, you eat for breakfast, let's say, um, you eat a bagel, right? Not whole wheat bagel, but just regular bagel. Regular bagel is pure starch. It's just, just, just starch, nothing more than starch. Okay. So, which means it's going to be digested fast. So once it's going to be digested, your glucose levels, since starch is going to be broken down to glucose, your glucose levels in blood will spike. They spike like this. That's how much glucose your cells will take. But cells can't take everything. It's way too much for your cells. So they say, this is the amount of glucose we are taking for energy. You still have this surplus, right? Then this glucose will be, will go to storage. And as I said, Animals can store glucose as a polymer called glycogen, right? Animals. Glycogen is normally stored in your muscles when it could be needed for energy and in the liver. And you're still left with this. The problem is that glycogen is limited storage, right? It's not going to take all extra glucose. So where is this going to go? And it's going to go to storage that unfortunately unlimited. And this is the fact, right? What does it mean? It means that when you eat carbs and you think about not gaining weight, I guess for many of you, it's not an issue, right? Um, but just in case, if you think about not gaining weight, you have to eat carbs that won't give you this spike, right? Whenever you get the spike, the extra will turn into fat. You should eat some, something that's going to keep your glucose levels stable in the blood. And what helps to keep it stable in the blood are actually fibers. For example, mangoes. Mangoes, they have fibers that actually keep your glucose level stable. Mangoes, pineapples, they're excellent, right? Because they prevent having uh, this converted into fat. Oh, blood. What? Yes, what's the question? Guys. Um, yes. I just, um, so you're basically giving us a lowdown on nutrition. So basically different types of uh, acids and, and nutrients are digested differently in your stomach. And of course, that's what I'm like. Yeah, I'm talking about this. Right now. Sorry about that. I'm just not getting it. It works either, bro. No, I'm talking about carbs. Right now I'm talking about carbs. I didn't get to proteins. I didn't get to fats or anything. I'm just talking about carbs. I'm just saying that carbs are a major source of energy, right? But what is the molecule of energy is a glucose. 
I'm gonna shoot today. I'm having an exam. Okay, so the major molecule is the glucose. Uh, glucose produced by plants. <clears throat> and plants can store it either as polymer called starch or polymer called cellulose. I tried to explain that starches are digested easily. Cellulose is not digested, right? Um, and what I'm saying is like when you consume starches, what actually happens with the glucose in your body, okay? Glucose could be used by cells. Glucose could be stored as a glycogen and extra glucose could be stored as a fat. That's like what is the major idea of what I was talking about. Okay, so uh, this is again, in this diagram you can see uh, glucose, fructose, these are monomers, right? Monosaccharides. Uh, glucose plus fructose, the molecule we know as sucrose, this is your table sugar. Yeah, sugar, right? Sugar that uh, we put in coffee and tea, sugar that, you know, donuts, muffins, sorry. Uh, yeah, donuts, muffins could be sprinkled. Since it's a, you see, it's a desaccharide. It's a double molecule, right? It's digested super fast, right? Immediately, pretty much like in no time. And again, it's also going to give a spike of glucose in the blood because what's going to happen to uh, fructose, fructose uh, already, you know, on the way to your blood will be converted to glucose as well. And as I said, complex. Complex is a starch that we can digest. Complex is the cellulose that we can digest. And you see, that's what I was talking about. Popcake, you get the spike. And this is hummus, right? Hummus will keep the sugar levels in your blood stable. Um, and Cellulose, I actually explained to you. Cellulose is the one that supports the plants, right? Uh, another polymer of uh, glucose is called chitin. Chitin uh, is make, makes actually exoskeleton, remember exoskeletons of insects and remember arthropods, right? So uh, lobster, shrimps, their shell is made of polysaccharide, it's actually polysaccharide, called chitin. We can digest it either, right? The only complex carb that we can digest is starch, right? Cellulose and chitin we can digest. So that's pretty much it about, um, that's pretty much it about carbs. I can actually add something else about carbs that you might actually listen to me and find it interesting. Um, as I said, what we do, we take that what we do, that's our cells do. But you can give glucose um, without oxygen. You can give glucose to, for example, yeast or to some, um, to some bacteria. They can break it down all the way to carbon dioxide and water. Instead of respiration, they do a reaction called fermentation. And what they're gonna give you, they will break it down to Um, what is this molecule? Anybody knows? What is this molecule? C2H5OH. Okay, this is molecule of alcohol. Okay. Um, our muscles can also do fermentation, but uh, our muscles don't produce alcohol. Our muscles produce lactic acid. But again, a lot of simple organisms like yeast, 
again, like number of bacteria can produce alcohol, right? Uh, and depends on what kind of sugar you give them, you get different kinds, right? If you use if you use glucose from grapes, what do you get? Talk to me. What? Sucrose, sucrose, sucrose. If you use grapes, what alcohol you get? Wine. Uh, wine. Yes. If you use, uh, for example, apples, what do you get? Apple cider. I get apple cider. If you use, uh, if you use barley, what do you get? What? Beer. Beer, you can get whiskey, right? If you use wheat, you get vodka, right? If you use if you use sugar cane, what do you get? No, come on. Is it rum? You get rum, exactly. If you use sugar cane, you get rum. And what do you use to get tequila? Agave. Agave, yes. So just keep in mind, yeah, alcohol is pretty much the molecule of alcohol is produced for molecule of glucose. And the last thing that I'm going to ask you, uh, does anybody know rubbing alcohol? Like, I mean, like alcohol that you can buy in the uh, pharmacy store. What is made of? It's made from wood. It's actually made of cellulose because cellulose again is made of glucose. Okay. So again, glucose is a central molecule in your metabolism. Why it's a central molecule? because this is the molecule used for energy, right? So energy is locked in glucose. There are ways how to store glucose. Glucose is stored in complex carbs, right? Plants store it as starch, as cellulose. Animals store it as glycogen, right? And some animals also use polymer of glucose as their exoskeleton, the chitin. Any questions about this? And again, why we love sweets, as I said, you look at something sweet, your brain sees energy. Anybody here who doesn't like sweets? Me, I don't, I don't like sweets. I don't eat them. Really? Yeah. So what do you prefer to eat over sweets? Um, I prefer to eat fruit as an alternative. Wow. Yeah. Lucky you, my gosh. <laughs> I can tell you, I I can like I I'm okay like with cakes. I'm okay with candies. I'm okay with chocolate. Something that I can't resist is ice cream. I see ice cream and it's like that's it. <laughs> Next group are lipids, right? Lipids or fats. So uh, lipid molecules are not, again, exactly polymers. Um, if you look at fats, it's actually three fatty acids attached to a molecule that is actually alcohol called sterol, right? So three fatty acids attached to, uh, sorry, attached to uh, alcohol molecule called glycerol, not sterol, glycerol, right? Um, um, fatty acids are long molecules. If you look at this, right? So long molecules that have a carbon as a core with many bonds, right? And in these bonds, that's where the energy is locked. So fatty acids could be used for energy as well, like glucose. And actually, they liberate even more energy than glucose liberates. What's the problem? The problem is that glucose burns clear, right? 
clear means once you burn glucose with oxygen, you get carbon dioxide, you exhale, and water. When you burn fatty acids, you get um, byproducts that are slightly toxic. So, I mean, in fair, fair levels, yeah, go ahead and burn them, and you should burn fats from time to time. But if you burn only fats for energy, that's actually going to affect your health, your metabolism. I can give you an example. When you burn fats, byproducts of this burning is acetone, right? Acetone is what? What is acetone? Um, I just know I use that to take off color off my nails. Exactly. Acetone is a nail polish remover. Exactly. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, like you should be really, really easy on this one for yourselves because it's toxic for the cells. So as I said, if you have glucose, your cell will go, first of all, for glucose to burn for energy. You run out of glucose, cells going to start using fatty acids for energy, right? But normally, normally, fats is... Uh, I should say it's a definitely structural molecule as well. Energy and structure, right? You need fat. Um, it might sound like kind of uh, weird, right? But yes, we need fat. We need fat under our skin. Why? This fat, first of all, helps to keep us warm, right? It's an insulator. It's a layer that helps to maintain proper body temperature without fluctuation. Second, fat I mean, it's also like, trust me, if you, if you take fat from under your skin, you're going to look so scary. You have no clue. Yeah, horrible. So uh, under your skin, it makes your skin looking like smooth. And um, smooth and I mean like kind of like normal, right? Um, fats also... Uh, support a bunch of structures in your body. Uh, fat is insulator not only for temperature, fat is also insulator in your nervous system because your nervous system communicates with electrical signals. So something has to provide natural insulation for this electrical impulses, okay? So fats are important. Uh, this one, uh, what we call triglyceride. Triglycerides, again, molecule of glycerol and three fatty acids attached. Your body fat and oils. Oils you get from plants, right? Um, we're going to talk about saturated fats. Uh, there are molecules called sterols. Sterols or steroids. And first of all, it's cholesterol, right? and they are important part of your cells. And this molecule is used as a, um, used to build hormones, chemical messengers that control a lot of things in the organism. In another group called phospholipids, phospholipids, fatty acids, and uh, this is called a phosphate, molecule, uh, phosphate part. They build their cell membranes in the cells. So these are the fats, right? Triglycerides, fats and oils. One more time, glycerol and three fatty acids. And as I said, fat has more energy stored than carbs, right? So you get fats when you eat, when you eat like a lot of things, you get fat. When you eat meat, there are always some fat in the meat. Uh, some fat uh, is found, yeah, I should say like a lot of veggies, like avocados. Avocados have very good healthy fat. Um, when you drink milk, there's some fat in milk as well. And I'm pretty sure you heard about saturated, unsaturated fat. Yes. 
So what is saturated? Saturated fat is if you look at this chain, right? It's a carbon chain. And these are like light molecules, uh, hydrogen, right? So for like carbons form single bonds with each other. And other bonds actually bind hydrogen. This is saturated. And this molecule is straight. So it's straight and uh, the molecules in this fat packed really, really tightly. Um, all saturated fats at room temperature are solid, right? Like margarine, like butter, right? So this all saturated fats. Unsaturated fats, you see some carbons with each other have double bonds. This double bond actually makes molecules slightly bent. So you see, this fatty acids saturated, they straight. This fatty acids unsaturated, so they slightly kinked, right? Which means molecules push each other away. So these molecules make up liquids. So uh, saturated, as I said, butter, margarine, unsaturated are oils. I'm sure you heard that oils are healthier than margarine, yes? Have you heard about that? Guys, talk to me. Yes, we have yes. heard that, uh, yes, we have heard that that a margarine is uh, healthier than butter, but that's not true because- no, margarine is not healthier than butter. No, it's not because of the oils and the um, artificial ingredients used to make it. Um, olive oil is healthier than butter, but I should say butter also has a bunch of good stuff as well. So I should say like, again, moderation is a key. So I shouldn't say you have to take butter out of your diet completely. Butter is a good source of vitamin A, for example, vitamin E. But when you talk about saturated, unsaturated, the thing is that unsaturated, these molecules are less stable, which means that your body can engage them, can use them to make something else. Saturated molecules are un very, very stable, super stable. So um, it's harder to engage them, and very likely this molecule will go to storage. Okay, so that's the difference. And trans fats. Trans fats is actually, um, you see, when you use unsaturated fat as an oil and you heat it, this molecule will change its shape. So this is called cis form. Cis form, you see, these two hydrogens are on one side of the molecule. In trans form, they will actually move apart. Okay. And they are actually uh, far less healthier far, far less healthier. Uh, they usually formed when you heat oil, like when you cook. So for example, I'm pr probably, you probably heard that if you uh, make like French fries, right? And you use the oil again and again and again, it's not a good thing, it's not a healthy thing because again, uh, the oils, the fats in the oils, sorry, fatty acids in the oils will move into trans fats. Okay, and this is cholesterol. And as I said, cholesterol is an important part of uh, cells. It's a molecule found in the cell membrane. Excessive cholesterol is associated with cardiovascular diseases because it tends to accumulate on the walls of the blood vessels cause inflammation and increase risk for heart attack and stroke. But at the same time, a bunch of hormones in your body are made from cholesterol molecule, like sex hormones, estrogen, testosterone, thyroid hormones, they're all made of cholesterol. So cholesterol is, I mean, it's not an enemy, it's actually a very important molecule. This are steroid hormones. And uh, the last group 
are phospholipids. So what is phospholipids? This is a phosphate group. In the phosphate group, two fatty acids are attached. Now, phosphate group is hydrophilic. Fatty acids are hydrophobic. This one can interact with the water and whatever is mixed with the water. These two molecules repel water. So they, once they form a layer, it's a very interesting layer of molecules that part is hydrophilic, part is hydrophobic. And next week we're going to talk about the cells and I'll spend more time actually talking about phospholipids explaining how they form the cell membrane. Uh, vaxes. Vaxes made by insects, by plants, and vaxes are hydrophobic. So they usually use to isolate water and whatever can mix with the water. Plants use vaxes to prevent evaporation, like the plants that actually need to conserve water in areas where the climate is dry. You can usually find like a layer of wax over the leaves that prevents water evaporation. Okay. So we talked about carbs, we talked about fats. Two more groups. And I just want again to repeat carbs, energy, um, fats, energy, and structure. Proteins are the group of molecules that actually not only about structure, uh, these molecules are also about function. And proteins probably are the most important molecules in all living organisms. Why so? Uh, if you talk about human body, for example, in human body, you have um, like almost like 50% of human body is water. If you take dry weight, what is not water, half of this dry weight will be actually proteins. Proteins make up structures like bones, like muscles. Again, they make up most of the structures within the cell. And proteins also provide function of the cells. And actually, if you look at each other, what you see from the outside, you see proteins. Major protein in the skin and hair, keratin, right? Uh, major protein also in the skin is collagen, collagen fibers. Um, another important protein, um, let me think about another important protein, keratin, collagen, um, Okay, we'll get to this. We get to more proteins. So again, this is a very large group and also very diverse. As I said, proteins are structure. See hair, fingernails, feathers, horns, cartilage, tendons, I will say muscles, bones. Protection, uh, proteins from blood clot that prevent bleeding and also um, in the immune system, there are proteins that called antibodies that protect from infection. Regulation. Cells pretty much uh, use proteins for communication. Chemical messengers. Movement, contraction. Proteins in the muscle, like in the heart muscle or in your skeletal muscles, allow the movement. Transportation. There are special proteins that carry things around the body, like hemoglobin is the protein that carries oxygen, okay? So again, it's not only structural, it's a functional group and functions are very, very different from each other. So how proteins are built? Proteins build of monomers called amino acids. There are 20 amino acids total, right? So these 20 amino acids actually contribute to a variety of proteins that our body can produce. But tell me first, what is a good source of proteins in your diet? 
fish, um, beans. Uh, um, red meat. Red meat too, yeah. What else? Um, I forgot this question. Nuts, like peanuts. 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 What else? What else? No, there's a big group of products that actually have proteins. Um, would it be eggs? Eggs, yes. A uh, rice. Um... Rice, uh, not that much. Rice is mostly carbs, but the large group of dairy products. Dairy. See, that was just on my mind. See, you read my mind. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Cheese. Yogurt, uh, they also a good source of proteins. Milk, no. Milk is mostly carbs, but cheese and yogurt are mostly proteins, okay? So, amino acids. So, amino acids are organic molecules, and what you can see, they form, able to form bonds. Uh, and once they form bonds, they form chains. They form long molecules, right? And actually, arrangement of the atoms in amino acid groups attached to carbon, they also define type of amino acid. But like, again, like letters make words, amino acids make proteins. So each protein is different from another one by number of amino acids and the order of amino acids in the chain, okay? And this actually um, number complete, incomplete. This is like, okay. Let me just show you a few things. So complete, incomplete. Um, let me use the whiteboard. Okay, so how it, how, how it happens. Basically it happens this way. Let's say you eat chicken, right? And chicken has protein. Let's say it's called protein A, right? So chicken protein is made of chain of amino acids, right? Uh, so you eat chicken protein and your stomach will digest. What does it mean it will digest? Stomach will break down this chain into amino acids, right? Single units. These amino acids will be picked up from digestive tract by bloodstream, right? And blood is delivered to your cell. So this is your cell. Your cell will take this amino acid, right? And will build its own protein, right? Let's say it's also protein A. Very similar to chicken protein, but not the same, right? So one more time, we eat proteins as a source of amino acids only. It's like, for example, I think a good analogy will be, um, let's say you get a truck made of Lego. Do you like Legos, guys? A bit old for Legos, but yes. So you get this truck, right? You take it apart. You pick a couple Lego pieces and you build track again. Maybe very similar to the first one, but your track, okay? So we are different from chicken because we have human proteins, right? The same amino acids, but it's a human version, right? Plants have proteins from the same amino acid, but it's a plant version, and so on, and so on, and so on. Is it clear, guys, about Protein. So we eat, basically, we eat proteins as a source of amino acids. That's all we need, right? And I think here it actually says that there are complete proteins. So complete proteins provide you with all amino acids that you need. Meat. Meat, fish, right? Uh, if you are vegetarian, anybody here who's a vegetarian? Yes. It's hard. What? It's hard. It is hard. It's hard to be vegetarian. 
right? But if you try to get amino acids from plants, uh, it's gonna be incomplete, right? So certain amino acids you won't be able to get. Complementary proteins, right? Complementary is uh, like what you can see here. Um, you, again, you complement, you eat combination of proteins to provide you. Actually, some, some grains actually are good source. Even if you like vegetarian, uh, for example, quinoa. You know quinoa? Love quinoa, yeah. Yes, quinoa. Yeah, I like it too. It's actually a really good source of, uh, I think it's a, almost complete. If it's not complete, complete, it's almost complete in amino acids, okay? Um, humans basically have to eat proteins not only for muscles and bones. Our brain actually is a big fan of proteins as well. Like we have to eat meat, first of all, to feed our brain and then the rest of the body. Um, and another thing here is that I told you, your cells take amino acids and build proteins. Your cells build proteins because that's what makes them up, right? That's what allows the function of your cells. So cells are super busy with building them. Um, and what your cells do initially, they again, take a chain of amino acids build the bonds between amino acids. This bond's called peptide bonds. But chain is usually a protein that is like preliminary. It's not really uh, fully functional at this point. So for to make protein functional, it has to be folded. So usually it's folded first like this. Um, like uh, like a helix, and additional bonds are formed, for example, hydrogen bonds. Then it will take three-dimensional structure that's called tertiary structure. And for some proteins, which made of number of chains, this is called quaternary structure. So again, until protein acquires tertiary or quaternary structure, it really depends on complexity. This protein is useless, okay? So cells one more time, first they build a chain and then cells gonna tediously fold and fold and fold to make this protein working. Um, and uh, next thing basically, how can you, can you go back and forth? So proteins actually can change their normal three-dimensional form into a chain uh, under certain conditions. The most common condition is heat. When you heat protein, they go from 3D to chain. This is called denaturation. I can also do it, uh, for example, in, um, did you ever try to put, to mix uh, milk with a vinegar? No? Uh, if you mix milk with a vinegar, it's gonna like, like crumble. Uh, this is another example of denaturation, actually. Uh, but I think, um, think about eggs, right? So you take a raw egg, and the white of the raw egg is actually just pure protein. And it's like, a, not liquid, but like a liquid, right? You boil it, it turns into what? Once you boil the egg, it becomes solid, solid right? Uh, which one do you prefer to eat, raw or solid? Solid. <laughs> you can eat raw, right? Well, you can, okay. yeah. But look, why, listen, why humans prefer to cook them proteins? It's much easier for your digestive system, for your stomach to break it down, right? It's easier to break it down from a chain than from this complex 3D shape. 
So we usually think we cook eggs, we cook meat, we cook beans for better taste. No, we actually cook them for better digestion. I mean, can you eat raw beans? No. I mean, you can chew them. <laughs> and probably, probably your stomach will be able to digest. Like some people eat raw meat, right? Do you like sushi? Yeah. Like sushi, I mean, that's different. <laughs> it's raw fish, right? Sushi, sashimi. Um, but yes, but the whole idea is now it's actually quite a long. Uh, it's a long way to digest proteins. Your stomach spends like um, a four, four to six hours digesting them. But look, it's a tough job, you know to cut it, like act like a scissors, like cutting, 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 cutting. And as I said, it's much easier for your stomach to do so if it's in denaturated form rather than complex three-dimensional, okay? And uh, basically says that curly hair and straight hair is protein called keratin in, the uh, in their hair that pretty much makes a difference. And certain treatments can do both ways, right? Certain treatments can straighten the hair, certain treatments can curl the hair. And um, proteins that function, now proteins that function are called enzymes. I really want you to pay attention to this definition. Enzymes basically conduct chemical reactions in your body, right? So you see, this is the protein called lactase. Um, in milk, there is a disaccharide called lactose, right? So lactose has quite an interesting story, by the way. Um, let me tell you. Let me tell you the story. I'm sure you heard about being lactose intolerant. Yes? Anyone here? Anyone um, here who is lactose? Lactose intolerant, you all can drink milk without stomach ache. Yes, yes. Actually, humans have different degrees of lactose intolerance. I am. Um... Yes. Uh, now, what is the whole story about? The whole story is about that. Think not about humans, think about kittens, right? So newborn kittens are nursed by the mother. And then how many months? I'm not sure how many months old when they are weaned, right? Weaned means they don't drink mother's milk anymore. Did you ever ask a question why they stop drinking mother's milk? Okay, the story goes that once you drink milk, the sugar, called lactose, has to be broken down. If it's not broken down, it continues into large intestine. In large intestine, there are bacteria that they will do this job. They will break it down, but they're gonna release a bunch of gases that are gonna cause stomach ache. So um, in kittens, at a certain point, what happens, this enzyme is not produced anymore. They become lactose intolerant. And this lactose intolerance causes pain so they stop drinking milk. Humans were designed pretty much the same way. Humans also designed to, I don't know, by age two years old, become lactose intolerant and stop drinking mother's milk. But in humans, it's all messed up because, you know, certain conditions, humans actually had to uh, breastfeed longer than maybe it was intended, okay? But anyways, in many humans, this enzyme is still there, lactase. But in many humans, this enzyme actually is gone and they become lactose intolerant. But again, becoming lactose intolerant is actually a natural thing. Yeah, you get it? Uh, again, that's how animals stop drinking milk. And humans, you know, grown-ups, humans not supposed to drink milk. 
It's for kids. It's not for adults. Adults don't really benefit from drinking milk. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is that lactase is enzyme, and enzymes literally conduct chemical reaction or what's said, increase likelihood for reaction. So the chemicals on their own might not actually interact, right? Nothing can happen, but enzymes will make that happen. And there's something also called activation energy. And activation energy is actually, um, let me go back. Uh, it's energy that pretty much uh, needed to initiate chemical reaction, okay? So sometimes it can be temperature, sometimes it can be change in pH, sometimes it can be uh, change in the conditions that actually will uh, provide like a push, okay? So this push uh, could also be like called a catalyst, right? Catalyst is like a third party present at the chemical reaction that actually makes it happen. And again, to make it happen, you have to provide activation energy, right? The push. And um, what enzymes do, enzymes can help with the activation energy in a way like, for example, um, yes, they can regulate it by regulating uh, concentration, temperature, pH. And there are two important things called inhibitors and activators. Let me just write it down for you. Inhibitors actually uh, stop reactions. Inhibitors and activators make them up. And I think the next few slides basically show this. So enzyme activity. So enzyme activities depend definitely on uh, concentration, right? So substrate are basically chemicals that have to participate in chemical reaction, right? And uh, enzyme activity definitely depends on their concentration. Temperature. For some reactions, temperature could be really crucial. So you need optimal range of the temperature. Like you slow, you lower it and everything will slow down. You bring it up, everything is too fast for, again, for any reactions to happen. pH. So for certain enzymes, they can function only within normal pH range. Not normal, I mean optimal. For example, it could be either in uh, run neutral. But for example, enzymes in your stomach, they can function actually on a very low pH. And these are inhibitors or activators. So activators stimulate, increase reaction rate, and inhibitors actually block uh, chemical reactions. And the last thing about proteins, what's called misspelled proteins. Like, you see, this is the protein. This is the right sequence of amino acids. But instead of one amino acid, you put wrong one. Like you see, instead of protein, you say like protein, right? Uh, this one, once basically uh, undergoes folding into 3D shape, will actually acquire a wrong one. You see here and here, they look different. 
So one amino acid actually can screw the whole entire protein, and this protein is going to lose its function. And actually, most of the genetic diseases that people suffer are from mistakes in amino acids that build the proteins. Like uh, in sickle cell anemia, actually the hemoglobin protein has one wrong amino acid. And because of one wrong amino acid, red blood cells look different, and that's what causes the disease, right? And the last thing, so guys, the last thing are nucleic acid, nucleotides and nucleic acid. And let me explain you something before that. So as I said, proteins are made of amino acids, right? And who makes the proteins? Your cells, right? So the question is how cells know what proteins to make? and how to make them. So cells need instructions, right? And these instructions come as what? Anybody can tell me how cells get instructions for proteins, how to build proteins? Mm, come on, talk to me. Guys, we're almost done, and then you'll take a break, and then we're gonna do the work. I don't know. I don't know how they get it. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. <laughs> so, how cells... Okay, cells have instructions, and these instructions taken together are called genetic material. Your genes. So basically your genes are instructions about what proteins to make, right? Basically one gene is a code for one protein. And that's what I was trying to, to explain to you. Right? Chicken are chicken because chicken are made of chicken proteins, right? And why chicken have chicken proteins? Because they have chicken genes. Bananas are bananas because they have bananas genetic material, which means bananas proteins and a bunch of other things. Humans have human genetic material, right? Which they might share a lot with chicken, but still it's human. Now, something really mind blowing, all humans all humans share genes. Basically, 0.99% of our genes are identical to each other. It's only 0.01% that what makes us look different, right? Maybe different from each other, not that much, right? So uh, why genetic disease? Genetic disease means there's a gene that codes for wrong protein, right? And this wrong protein basically affects the health. Like as I said, hemoglobin. Or for example, um, well, let me think about another genetic disease. What's a good genetic disease? I might think. Can you give me an example of genetic disease, guys? Diabetes, maybe. What? Diabetes. No, diabetes is not genetic disease. Genetic disease is something that is present from the very, very beginning. Oh, something no. that we can't avoid. What? Cancer? No, cancer is not genetic. I mean, it has also strong genetic association. What about Down syndrome? Uh, it's not gen genes. It's actually a uh, chromosomal problem. What? I don't hear you well. I don't hear you well. Um, I said sickle cell anemia. Would that count? Sickle cell anemia is a genetic disease. Absolutely. Uh, I was trying to think about another one that might be a good example of genetic disease. Um, 
Um, Down syndrome. No, Down syndrome is a chromosomal problem. It's not. It's not about genes. Uh, but, uh, for example, um, some some sorts of deafness actually genetic. Okay, there is a disease that usually check for it called cystic. And it's actually quite common. And in this condition, what happens uh, in your cells, in the cells, there are channels. Channels that move water in and out, right? What happens in cystic fibrosis, uh, this channel actually have abnormal shape. And the channel is made of proteins. So the channels have abnormal shape. And cells tend to produce too much fluids. Too much fluids, like in the airways, they clog the airways, people can't breathe normally. Uh, these fluids accumulate in digestive tract, in urinary tract, in the reproductive tract. It usually affects reproduction as well. For a very long time, kids born with cystic fibrosis, they couldn't survive, like, you know, into adulthood. And nowadays, there are treatments, medical treatments, and uh, I'm sure you heard about gene therapy. Gene therapy is actually to, in case of genetic diseases, uh, help with this genetic problem, right? So fix the problem on the level of DNA, on the level of gene. So, the gene therapy possible, so they actually live into adulthood. But these poor people have to take 30 pills every day. Can you imagine, in this condition, 30 pills. And from time to time, they have to go to the hospital and their airways have to be cleaned, declogged. Another genetic disease, I don't know if you've heard about, so, have you heard about muscle dystrophy? No. Muscle dystrophy is uh, it's it's a disease that actually uh, like there are different forms. One form, children start to develop it quite early, like age three. Other form, uh, it's developed later. But it's a protein in muscles called dystrophin. If this protein is actually uh, mutated, mutation it means mistake in genetic material. Uh, start to destroy the muscle cells. Muscle cells make up muscles. Muscles progressively become weaker and weaker and they can't support the body. And uh, it causes paralysis over time. Okay, This is genetic disease, means that if you're born with abnormal mutated gene, you have it. Other diseases like cancer, like diabetes, they associate it with certain genes, but it doesn't mean 100% the person will be sick. It's only increased risk of these diseases. Any questions here, guys? And Professor, what about Down syndrome? Is that Down good? syndrome, uh, we're gonna talk about this later. It's a chromosomal abnormality. We have 46 chromosomes in Down syndrome, is 47. And have an extra chromosome, actually, it's not an advantage, it's a disadvantage because it affects, um, it affects structure and function of cells. Anything else? Okay, so genetic material. Um, two nucleic acids that uh, we're going to talk about. One is a molecule called DNA. Another molecule is called RNA. Uh, made of building blocks called nucleotides. Okay, So nucleotide is actually a molecule that is made of sugar. It's a pentose. In case of DNA, it's called desoxyribose. In case of RNA, it's called just a ribose. It's a phosphate group and something called nitrogenous base. This is the base. So nucleotides differ by 
nitrogenous bases they have. They might have base called adenine, or thymine, or guanine, and cytosine. And basically, uh, if we look at their DNA molecule, right? So this is the DNA molecule. DNA molecule is a huge molecule. It's a super long molecule. And something is mind blowing. If you take DNA molecule out of your cell, it's gonna be like this. Can you see me? Can you see me? It's gonna be like three feet long. Can you imagine a molecule that is three feet long packed into the cells that you can't even see without microscope? So, DNA has all genetic information of the whole entire organism. And uh, as I said, one gene is code for one protein. Our cells can produce up to 40,000 proteins. So it's 40,000 genes. This is a whole entire DNA. And uh, DNA is made of two strands. And each strand is a combination, is a sequence of nucleotides. As I said, adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine. Two strands are called complementary. What does it mean, complementary? You probably learned this at school. A always pairs with T, right? C always pairs with G. So if you know sequence of nucleotides in one strand, you'll be able to build the second one by complementary rule. So their bases help to maintain the shape, this double helix or double strand, because they form hydrogen bonds, okay? Between adenine and thymine, guanine and cytosine, there are hydrogen bonds that keep the shape of the molecule. Guys, are you there with me? Some of you, I can see some of you. Don't see, guys. As I said, like a few minutes, I'm done, and you'll take a break. You can have a break. Okay, so adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine. And as I said, DNA corresponds to all genetic material. But, but uh, your cells, as I said, they build proteins, right? One gene, one protein. So for the cell to get instruction, which protein to build, it gets a message. And the message comes as a messenger RNA. Whenever protein has to be synthesized, right? Uh, it means the gene responsible for the protein becomes activated. So once the gene is activated, the puppet of this gene will be made into molecule of RNA. RNA is single strand. RNA will provide instruction to the cell which protein to build, okay? Uh, RNA is different because it has one strand and also because instead of thymine, it has a molecule called uracil, okay? So two major differences. Uh, so the story goes that DNA, all genes, RNA, one gene, one gene is one protein, okay? So one more time, to summarize this, to summarize it, carbs, energy, fats, energy and structure, proteins, structure and function, and nucleic acid is Info, right? Genetic material. So there's four important macromolecules. I'm done. Any questions? <laughs>